Good afternoon and welcome to the Energy Prospectus Group webinar hosted by Range Resources. Today's webinar will be U.S. natural gas and NGL market, a bullish outlook for 2021 and beyond. This event, event will be recorded. During the presentation, all participants will be muted. If you have any questions you would like to ask the speaker, please type them into the chat feature. We will read and answer questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now here's Dan Steffens who will introduce today's speaker. Hey, welcome everybody to our largest attended webinar. We had almost 75 people uh, registered today. So hopefully most of them will uh, get on with us live here today. But uh, today we have a very timely topic since the front month NYMEC futures contract for natural gas went over $3 per MMBTU this morning. And that's about a month earlier than I ha had even expected. And I've been accused many times of being too optimistic about this. But if you've been uh, attending my podcast on the weekends, you know that uh, I've been seeing a much tighter U.S. gas market coming uh, for the last couple months on my podcast. So anyway, uh, Range Resources is one of the three gassers in our Sweet 16 growth portfolio. And I define a gasser as an upstream oil and gas company that gets the majority of their revenues from the sale of natural gas and natural gas liquids, our NGLs. Uh, Range is one of the largest producers of natural gas and NGLs in North America. And I've been following this company closely for over 15 years. And actually, when I took over uh, EPG in 2006, it was one of the companies in our Sweet 16 back then, too. So over 97% of the company's 380,000 uh, BOE per day of production is natural gas and NGL. So it's a true gasser. Uh, approximately 2.2 BCF per day is what that comes to. Uh, we have uh, three members of Range Resources Management on the webinar today, and they are going to give us an update on the U.S. natural gas and NGL markets. Our first speaker is Lay Sandow. He's Vice President of Investor Relations. Uh, Leith has a financial background and he is a CPA. So he's going to kick us off with some highlights on range and then he will introduce the other speakers. Go ahead, Leith. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, we very much appreciate the opportunity to talk about natural gas and NGL macro today. We're, I think we're equally thrilled with the way the market is, is setting up for both natural gas and NGLs as we head into this winter and 2021. So agree. I think this is, is great timing. We appreciate you putting this together and we appreciate everybody taking the time today. Also with me on the call today are Alan Engberg, Range's Vice President of Liquids Marketing, and Ben Stanton, uh, Director of Energy Commodities and Research. Alan and Ben both play key roles in developing Range's internal macro outlook, and that helps inform the board and senior management on hedging decisions, marketing strategy, capital allocation, et cetera. And when Ben and Alan have had the chance to discuss their macro views with some of our institutional investors, uh, the, the investors have always communicated to me how impressed they are with the team's understanding of the market. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Uh, before I kick it over to them to talk macro, I thought I'd spend just a couple slides to help provide some context for the discussion as far as what improving prices can mean for range and our shareholders. So this is compliments of general counsel. So who is range? Uh, Dan, you've covered us for a long time, but for those that might be less familiar, range pioneered the Marcellus shale over 15 years ago, which has since become the largest natural gas field in the US. Range produces about 1.6 BCF a day of natural gas, putting us in the top 10 amongst US independents. Range also produces over 100,000 barrels a day of NGLs, putting us in the top five. Of growing importance for many investors in our sector is a focus on environmental efforts, and Range continues to lead the industry on a number of environmental fronts, including our 100% water recycling, and recently becoming the first US EMP to target net zero emissions. And lastly, on this slide, you'll see with today's talk about commodity pricing, I think it's interesting and important to think about, you know, what, what can that mean for the bottom line? And for range, 
having the lowest break-even costs amongst operators in Southwest Appalachia, I think is a good starting point, which is what the next slide highlights. So if you'll bear with me, I'll try to walk through this slide and how we can use this to, to estimate you know, ranges free cash flow under different pricing scenarios. So as shown on this slide, ranges cash costs. So that's LOE, gathering, processing, and transport, GNA, production taxes, interest. When you add those all up, it's about $1.80 per MCFE as of last quarter. So that's all costs besides our capital spending. If we look at capital spending, Range's drilling and completion budget for this year is about $400 million. If we divide that 400 million of capital by our expected 2020 production, that equates to about 50 cents per MCFE, which is the light blue bar on this page. As you can see, 50 cents per MCFE for capital is class leading and it's really driven by our peer leading well costs and our low corporate base decline rate. But when we add together that 50 cents per MCFE of CapEx with our $1.80 of cash costs, that gets us into the $2.30 range per MCFE for a break-even natural gas equivalent price. If we then consider the premium pricing that we get for our NGLs that's over and above gas price, we actually have a break-even that's lower than 230. So if we try and translate that 230 break-even into cash flow using some simple math, so starting with 230, assuming no uplift from NGLs, at 270 natural gas, we have a full cycle margin of 40 cents per MCFE. If we take that 40 cents of margin times our production of 800 BCF a year, that gets us about 300 million a year of free cash flow, which is a 15% free cash flow yield, which I think is, is pretty compelling. And that's using a 270 natural gas price, which is actually below the strip pricing for next year for both natural gas and for NGLs. So like I mentioned at the start, we're, we're thrilled with the macro setup heading into this winter and beyond. Uh, we expect that this is gonna translate into significant free cash flow and a free cash flow yield for range that's competitive with any industry. And with range's multi-decade core inventory, we believe we can generate a lot of value for range shareholders uh, in the years to come. So thanks again for, for everybody taking the time today. With that, I'll hand it over to Ben, who will kick things off on the natural gas macro. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll give an overview of why I think fundamentals have shifted dramatically this year to the positive, both for the medium and the long-term gas outlook. Um, the key headline being, Supply is down more than demand this year. Demand is already recovering right now at a faster pace than supply, and that's likely to continue to do so into the medium term unless gas futures prices move higher than they are currently. So starting on this slide here, I'm showing some charts on uh, recent moves in supply. You can see the right-hand chart is a high-frequency US gas pipeline flow data, which is a very good proxy for domestic dry gas production in the US. You can see the red line is 2020, the blue line is 2019. We peaked last year uh, in the fourth quarter at around 96, uh, 97 BCF a day uh, and fell significantly um, by the middle of the year uh, down to around 84 BCF a day. And as of today, after a return of some oil, uh, oil wells back online, we're at around 88, 89 BCF a day today. The bottom chart uh, on the right is the forecast from the uh, latest EIA short-term energy outlook. Um, they see a continued decline into the year end, um, troughing at around the second quarter of, of next year at close to 85 BCF a day, and then kind of flatlining from there. So basically on the supply side, exiting this year compared to last year, we're looking to be down between eight and nine BCF a day. Um, so a, a clear supply decline. And bear in mind that the EIA assumption going forward is assuming a $45 a barrel oil price in 2021. So to the extent that the strip uh, is accurate, which is currently at around $43, uh, then that forecast may be biased lower. 
I think it's helpful to explain for those who aren't too familiar with natural gas markets, the impact of associated gas on the market in recent years. Uh, associated gas is effectively gas which comes out of oil wells, so effectively a byproduct of the more oily biased producers. And they've been a key driver of natural gas supply that you can see in the uh, the bottom right chart from kind of 2014 onwards. If I just look at 2018 and 19, associated gas uh, provided three to four BCF a day per annum of supply growth in both of those years, um, and still makes up approximately a third of total gas production today. Now with the, uh, the double black swan event that we've had at the start of this year being COVID, uh, and then the, uh, the the price war between the Saudis, the brief price war between the Saudis and the Russians, that's driven a dr drastic cut in domestic oil production. So U.S. oil production looks to be down, exiting this year around two million barrels a day, and that's driving a lot of the uh, decline in associated gas as well, which is helping to bring the market on the supply side back into balance. In addition, uh, low prices on the gas side because of COVID impacts. Uh, have also pulled down the dry gas uh, rig count. So that's shown on the bottom left chart. Uh, the blue line is the total gas rig count on the left uh, per Baker Hughes. And this is showing the lowest number, I think, since uh, Baker Hughes began keeping records. Now, with the underperformance of energy shares over the last few years uh, as a sector and the fall in oil prices, there's a growing theme within the energy sector of what's known as shale 3.0 and effectively that's uh, defined as much greater focus on capital discipline. Um, historically the industry has drastically outspent cash flow um, over, over the last five years um, added to the fact um, that international oil companies are also pulling back um, production as well to fund dividends. The focus going forward for both big companies and medium-sized DMPs is to generate more free cash flow, uh, lower their overall growth rates to a more sustainable level. Um, you can't grow US oil production above global oil demand on a sustainable basis. Um, otherwise, you end up with a price decline like we've seen uh, in recent years, and also a cap on future growth. So a number of companies on the oil side are now saying that if oil prices recover above $50 a barrel, that any excess will be returned to shareholders uh, or, or to pay down a debt, um, and, and they'll cap their production growth in the kind of mid single digit growth rate. So what that effectively means is that in a higher price environment, the growth will be much more muted going forward than you will have seen uh, historically. And I think that's kind of reflected in where the rig count is uh, sitting uh, right now. And the final point I'll make on this slide as well is you need to factor in the hedge positions of uh, the, the gas industry for 2021 and 2022, uh, with capped availability being very tight for the energy space this year. A number of producers have hedged um, a lot of their gas production next year, both private companies uh, and public companies. A number of them are, are, are very hedged at the kind of 260 to 270 level. So they won't benefit uh, from the upside in prices in 2021, uh, which would, would potentially have enabled them to increase some, some activity had they wanted to do so. Let's move on to the next slide. Just covering the demand outlook. So this is my own view of what the uh, US gas demand forecast will look like uh, for the next 2020 20 to 25 period compared to what it was for the prior six year period. Um, I view this as a, as a very conservative uh, forecast with upside in a number of key areas. But the takeaway is roughly 17 BCF a day of demand growth going forward, which is lower than the rate we saw in the prior six years. Uh, you can see the the orange wedge represents LNG. I'll talk about that in more detail in some of the next slides, uh, but that's a key driver going forward. Um, the other key driver would be uh, the blue wedge, which is electric uh, power generation on the gas side. Um, note, note that that's smaller than the prior six years. I think there is considerable upside to the number that I have in my forward forecast here, but I'm taking a, a conservative view. Industrial demand uh, will also show recovery post the decline that we've seen this year uh, due to COVID. Um, so we should see an improvement in 2021 and 2022 before a, a slower rate of growth uh, thereafter. The headline on the LNG side is that um, current 
uh, export capacity is around uh, 10 BCF a day. And on my estimates, uh, that should grow uh, to around 18 BCF a day by 2025. Now, currently there's five BCF a day of projects uh, under construction and over 30 BCF a day of projects that have been proposed. Um, so I'm effectively assuming an additional two to three BCF a day of projects get sanctioned uh, in the 2021 to 2022 period, um, which would equate to the US taking a roughly 50% uh, LNG supply growth market share over the next five years, which is consistent with what we've achieved in the, uh, the prior period uh, as well. Moving on to the next slide to dive into some of these dynamics in a bit more detail to show why I think this is a conservative medium term forecast. Um, slide eight covers um, the electric uh, generation forecast on the gas side. And the right hand chart shows the share of natural gas and other sources um, of overall power generation in the US. And you can see the huge trend and the black line moving down is uh, coal. And coal effectively has been rendered uneconomic in many areas by the growth of uh, abundant low cost US natural gas. Uh, and as a result, gas has grown its share roughly 11 BCF a day over the prior 10 years, growing from 24% to 38% last year. And it's sitting right now at about 42%. So continued growth uh, this year. Uh, and that trend will continue, in my view, uh, going forward. Um, as it sits today, there's around 18 BCF a day of equivalent coal generation, which remains to be displaced in the US uh, power stack. Um, the announced retirements that the EIA have posted on their website stacks up at around 48 gigawatts for the next five year period. And that's what's reflected in my demand assumption. However, it's important to note that this is a lagging indicator. So as we've rolled through this year, that number has consistently grown. Uh, and looking at the announcements from companies like uh, Duke uh, last year, last week, who were the largest um, coal fired power generator in the US have announced that they're going to retire their entire coal fleet by 2030 in uh, North and South Carolina, representing 10 gigawatts of capacity, which isn't reflected in that number here. In addition, um, a number of nuclear plants, uh, which represent about 20% of the overall generation fleet uh, remain to be uh, are reaching their useful economic lives and are not getting extended because of cheap gas. Uh, so you're seeing some retirements there. And again, the the announcements that have been made are baked into the bottom right chart. Effectively combining those two together, there's around four and a half BCF a day of demand uh, going forward, assuming uh, a typical seven times heat rate for gas plants to pick those up. Um, renewables will continue to grow alongside natural gas. It hasn't grown as fast as gas uh, over the last 10 years, despite the, uh, the hype that you see. Uh, in, in a lot of um, papers, but I'd expect renewables to take a slightly bigger share going forward. Uh, but gas um, is essential to provide uh, backup in areas where you're seeing more renewables penetration going forward. Let's move on to the next slide to cover LNG. Um, a bit of a busy slide here, but I'm showing um, different cases around the world um, over the last few years on the left hand chart and then where the futures curve stood as of a couple of days ago on the right hand chart. Uh, the orange line represents Asian gas prices, the dark blue line is European uh, TTF prices. Uh, the impact of COVID um, this year um, had significant effects on global gas markets uh, combined with the fact that we had two warm winters in a row in uh, Asia and Europe. So coming out of winter, even before COVID, we had a large amount of uh, gas in storage in Europe, which was creating a, an overhang. And then COVID uh, pushed uh, demand down industrially and residentially further in Europe and Asia. As a result, this summer, uh, you can see the dark blue line dipped below uh, the, uh, the, the delivered US LNG uh, price, which is the, the light blue line uh, here. So briefly dip below. As a result, US LNG cargoes uh, dropped to around 3 BCF a day uh, in July, but have uh, now started to recover as of today. We're back up to 8.5 BCF a day. And the right hand chart would indicate uh, the ARV being fully open for this winter and next year, that November and December, we should 
be exporting close to full capacity at around 10 and a half BCF a day. So a very meaningful swing uh, in demand in just a matter of a few months, um, given that, as I said, we were doing three BCF a day in July. Um, as it currently stands today, US gas storage uh, looks set to end summer at around four TCF, which is slightly higher than normal, around a 300 BCF surplus to the five year. But with this trend of uh, full LNG exports uh, and normal weather assumed, we should be exiting this winter at close to 1.3 to 1.4 TCF uh, in the ground, which would be a, a drastic swing towards a 400 to 500 BCF storage deficit versus the five-year average. And this really explains why you're seeing prices react now. Um, we, we traded close to $2 or below for much of this summer. Uh, and as mentioned, prices have leapt up to $3 and trading at around three twenty dollars uh, for the winter contract uh, going forward. Um, in terms of overall demand trends that we're seeing um, in Europe, uh, power data uh, is in, and in Asia is indicating a steady recovery in electricity and gas demand, both on the generation and the residential side. And gas storage in Europe has moved below um, last year's level as we head Head into uh, the start of winter. One final thing I'll note on this chart here is that um, uh, with the second wave of COVID cases in Europe, um, will be nobody really knows what the impact of work from home will be on uh, residential demand, residential commercial demand for gas globally uh, this winter. Um, with likely offices remaining partially open and lockdowns less strict than they were in April and May, you'll like to see normal levels of commercial demand on the office side but residentially if people stay at home will they turn their thermostat to be warmer uh, than they usually would if they were outside the house at the office so you could have on peak days <clears throat> this winter uh, upside surprises to demand if that trend plays out the eia have tentatively uh, pegged that number domestically at around five percent higher residential demand per degree day this winter than they would normally. But to be honest, nobody knows until we actually see, but certainly something that could cause uh, demand spikes globally uh, this winter. Let's move on to the medium term outlook for LNG on slide 10. Uh, you can see on this chart here, I'm showing on the uh, top chart shows uh, year to date LNG uh, demand growth and LNG demand has been very robust considering uh, the, the, the kind of like black swan events that we've seen this year. In fact, LNG demand is up around 2% year to date, uh, year over year, which compares with global gas down around 3% year over year, oil, which is obviously more transport related and more impacted down 9%, and coal taking a much bigger hit down double digits um, as well. And this is being driven by stronger growth, uh, faster recovery in China, which is a uh, uh, capital, capital capex led uh, recovery on the infrastructure side. Um, and then India as well as starting to pick up some cargoes as they look to build out their gas uh, grid going forward as well. Um, the bottom chart shows uh, effective supply growth on the LNG side. And those of you that have ever been to, to London refer to the LNG supply market a bit like waiting for a bus in London. So you wait for uh, you wait for 30 minutes or 45 minutes and then three buses come along all at once. Uh, the LNG market's like that. It's a very capital intensive business and these projects take typically four to five years to come to fruition. So you can see the big cycle that we had in 2009 and 10 and we're just going through a big cycle, ending a cycle um, that started really in 2017. Um, and that, that led to a, an oversupply in the market combined with the two warm winters that I mentioned. Now, the good news on the medium term outlook is that there's a real dearth of supply going forward, at least for the next uh, two to three years. And then you, on the right hand chart, you can see the expected FIDs that would have been taken this year and next. Uh, this is data from Chenier. Uh, post COVID, you've seen a drastic reduction in the sanctioning of projects which could come online in 24 and 25. So in reality, some of the 25 and 26 projects are going to get delayed as well. Uh, this will mean that um, as demand starts to recover, you're going to need to see international gas prices move back towards uh, kind of $7 uh, per MMBTU going forward to uh, 
justify new LNG projects uh, getting off the line uh, globally. Moving on to some of the supply dynamics as well, having covered the demand side on slide 11, um, not many people appreciate this, but um, shale is a uh, shale gas supply uh, does have uh, an underlying decline rate, which uh, needs to be offset. Uh, our estimate is around a 26% uh, underlying decline. If all activity were to stop, that's how much production would drop around 27 BCF a day. And the rig counts in most basins today, given where they are, is are below sustaining levels, hence the need for um, prices to need to move higher to uh, justify at least keeping production flat, if not slight, low to mid single digit growth. Um, so gas overall 26% and important to note that range is well below this, we're sub 20%, which makes our sustaining capex needs much lower compared to the industry combined with obviously our peer leading low capital costs as well. And if I were to show you the oil uh, US oil data as well, the decline rates there are much sharper, closer to 35 to 40 percent, which makes the treadmill even harder for those guys as well. Now, public commentary going forward for 2021 indicates that uh, both oil and gas producers are targeting uh, maintenance mode. This plays into the shale 3.0 model that I talked about earlier, which is any excess cash will be used to pay down debt. Um, so what we really need to see, in my view, is the strip to move higher in 2022 onwards um, uh, to, to get producers to start committing to slightly more rigs. And the 2022 curve sits at 270 today, uh, rolling out past that, it drops down to 250 again. So my view is that we need to move up um, that entire curve from 22 to 25 to more, more like the $3 range to encourage more sustainable uh, investment in, in the gas side to meet that demand that I'm putting out there. Uh, now the final slide I'll have on the supply side on slide 12, this is an underappreciated area as well, is uh, there's growing evidence of US shale core exhaustion. Um, what effectively has been a tailwind to supply growth in our view is starting to turn into a headwind. Um, what this means uh, for those who aren't familiar is that over the last five to ten years of the shale development it's become a given that each year wells become more and more efficient um, through technology gains but the reality is that the data is starting to contradict that if you look at the bottom left chart um, we're showing here average us shale ore recoveries this is uh, peak rate per foot which is used as an industry metric to measure efficiency and we've kind of flatlined in 2018 and actually 2019 showed um, uh, an over 7% decline on the ore side, which has associated gas effects as well. This is being driven by wells being drilled too tightly together within uh, the shale units. So you've begun, begun to see communication or what's known in the industry as the parent-child effect. Um, oil operators have tried to reduce this impact by starting to up space, but that only effectively reduces your medium term inventory of core locations. The two right-hand charts here uh, show that this, some of this data is becoming evident on the gas side as well in Appalachia amongst uh, our peers. Uh, particularly if you took a look at the Ohio Utica data, there's a clear deterioration in the recoveries per lateral foot and you're beginning to see it in some of the uh, dry gas areas of Northeast PA and Southwest PA as well uh, amongst our peers. The key takeaway from this slide is that um, this really favours long life resource uh, companies like Range who have large positions in the core and the core of the plays in these shell basins are pretty well known and, and typically at most represent only 10% of the overall shale basin. But this, this trend here of declining efficiencies going forward creates upside risk to prices in the medium term in our view as the core inventory gets worked down. So moving on to slide 13. So just to wrap the supply and demand fundamentals uh, together, I'm showing a waterfall chart here. I mentioned the 17 BCF a day of demand growth domestically over the coming years with, with upside on the, certainly the domestic side. Um, and then rolling that together with some of the EIA medium term uh, supply outlook. So their, their number for associated gas supply was roughly six BCF a day growth over the same time frame. 
that has downside the longer prices remain sub $55 a barrel. Uh, and even if prices spike in our view because of shale 3.0, um, you're unlikely to see a, a major supply response because of uh, investor demands. Uh, the Haynesville and other section uh, represents around three BCF a day of Haynesville growth offset by declines in conventional legacy basins, effectively leaving uh, an over 11 BCF a day call on new gas supply from Appalachia. And it's our view that you really need a price of around $3 um, given currently current industry break-evens and investor demands for a return of capital and a, uh, improvement in balance sheets to be able to deliver that medium term supply growth. So wrapping up on slide 14, uh, key conclusions here. So demand growth of around 17 BCF a day with clear upside. Um, supply is down heavily and future growth is expected to be muted by shareholder demands as well as the natural uh, maturation of the shale industry after years of rampant growth. And the final point being the sweet spot exhaustion creates uh, upside uh, to the $3 target that we, we see going forward as well. With that, I'll hand over to uh, Alan and uh, look forward to taking some of your questions after. Thanks, Ben. Um, so my uh, presentation, I'll start off with uh, four slides with uh, just an introduction to NGLs. Um, then we'll dive into ethane fundamentals and then uh, propane fundamentals, and then we'll wrap it up. So to start with, um, every industry market has its own jargon with multiple names used interchangeably for the same thing. And uh, I'm guilty of flipping back and forth between the terms on this chart when talking about NGL. So I thought it might be worthwhile just to reference what they are and hopefully minimize any confusion. So to begin with natural gas liquids, very simply, uh, or NGLs uh, comprise ethane through pentane. Oops, uh, excuse me a second, there we go. Ethane through uh, pentane. And these products are often referred to also by just a number of carbons that they have in the molecule. So ethane is what we call the lightest NGL because it only has two carbons, whereas pentane at the other extreme has uh, five carbons. Um, if you want to impress some friends over a drink, you can talk about uh, normal and isobutane. Both have four carbons, but they're isomers. So they're basically the same number of atoms, but a different um, 3D structure uh, for the molecule, and that gives it different properties. LPG is uh, often referred to as well. LPG stands for liquefied petroleum gases. That's really a subset of NGLs. It's uh, propane and the butanes, and uh, it gets that name because they originate from refineries. So around the world, actually, most, um, most NGLs or most LPG comes from refineries. And the US is rather unique that uh, we have a lot of it coming from natural gas plants. Uh, we'll also talk about Y-grade. Y-grade is basically the full slate of NGLs before it gets processed. So it's a, it's a mingled stream where the products haven't been separated. And then from time, time, from from time to time, you'll hear about X-grade, which is uh, the same as Y-grade, except for the ethane has been kept in the gas. So the mixed unprocessed stream is just the propane through to the pentane. Next slide, please. So for those of you that aren't that familiar with NGLs, I thought it might be worthwhile just to kind of position ourselves. And you know, the, the question I would be asking is how relevant are NGLs? And if you look at the basic energy building blocks, crude, natural gas, and NGLs, um, taking EIA data from the latest month that they published, which is July, and multiply that by uh, Friday's closing prices, take those volumes, multiply it by Friday's prices, and you get a market of roughly a billion dollars a day in revenue. Crude oil is the majority of that at 57%, natural gas 31%, and NGLs represent 12%. Uh, so it's you know, a smaller piece, but it's still a significant piece of, uh, of the overall business, generating about $100 million a day in revenue. For range, since we're you know, a gas company, um, gas is the vast majority of our production, so it's 60% as of uh, 2019 revenue. 
Crude oil is less than 10%, uh, but the NGLs are a much bigger portion than the industry at large. For us, the NGLs are roughly 30%. And as uh, Leif mentioned earlier, we're a top five producer. Um, actually, I think we're around number three right now as far as independent uh, EMPs go. Next slide, please. The thing I find fascinating about NGLs is just how they're basically like in the middle of the mix. Um, it, they tie together crude markets and natural gas markets with downstream uh, demand. And to really understand NGLs, you need to understand crude and refining, natural gas and weather markets, chemical markets, as well as international supply and demand. Um, the U.S. is now the largest ethane, NX, and LPG exporter uh, in the world. Additionally, as you can see in the charts on field production, ethylene cracker expansions, and LPG exports, we've had tremendous um, change and growth over the last decades, which has uh, made these markets uh, really uh, a, a lot of fun, actually. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this one, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, relative to this year in particular, and COVID being um, a big impact on overall markets in general, for NGLs, actually, um, I hate to say it, but it, it's, it's been a, a, a good thing in a sense. Uh, if we look at the, the bar over on the right of the bar chart, COVID-19 impact, uh, for domestic demand for chemicals, it's actually been a positive. Non-durable demand has been uh, stronger this year than what it has been in past years. There has been some effect on durables, things like uh, polymers that go into housing and construction, as well as into the automotive sector. Um, the next sector of demand being um, heating and other for the US, really no change. But on the international front, it's uh, been much stronger. So a lot of the developing economies around the world use LPG, so propane and butane, for home heating and cooking. And with uh, lockdowns and people staying at home more, that aspect of demand has grown a lot internationally. For gasoline blending or for automotive or transportation fuels, the green bars, demand has gone down a bit in the US and that, that has been a negative impact. And then finally for exports, um, exports overall have been stronger for NGLs. Again, driven by that ResCom piece of international demand and by the chemical demand. And down below, you can also see kind of the winners and losers as far as the individual purity products. Uh, I won't go through that in detail, but the ethane and propane in particular has done quite a bit better. Uh, and that is by far the biggest part of the NGL barrel. Next slide, please. So uh, shifting over to ethane fundamentals. The fundamentals really are uh, bullish on ethane. Um, the chart on the top right shows total demand. So domestic ethane demand plus exports. The red line is 2020. Um, the shaded area is the five-year range. And you can see uh, 2019 and 2018 are also noted. And demand has been up strong. So again, that's mainly been the chemical demand as well as exports have uh, done quite well. In fact, July year to date, EIA data has shown that demand is up 9% year on year. Now supply has increased also, but actually it only increased uh, during um, the reported months of June and July to meet um, the demand and to offset the stock draws that we were seeing. Overall, the market's tighter by about 50,000 barrels per day. Down below, uh, the chart on the lower right shows days of supply for FA. Now, in a market, like I've shown uh, a slide or two back, where things are changing rapidly in terms of the installed basic capacity and overall demand, inventories really isn't a good measure of what's happening because the inventory needed to support the market is changing very quickly. So for that reason, we like to look at days of supply, which is basically taking your total in inventory and dividing that um, by your demand. And in this case, the demand is domestic demand plus the exports. You can see that red line has persistently been at the bottom end of the range this year. As a result of that, prices went from 
roughly at, at the low point in the panic with COVID in mid-April, I think Describing it, um, but if there's any questions, you know, just get back to me after. But uh, there's a couple charts here that I borrowed from RBN Energy's daily blog. Uh, the top one's just from this August. The bottom one is from last October. But they're there to illustrate a point. Um, first of all, on the, the top chart, uh, before I explain it, I need to just a quick refresher. With that thing, there's really only two sources of demand. Ethane will either go into the chemical industry as a feedstock to make ethylene, or it'll be left in the natural gas stream. And when it's left in the gas stream, we call that rejection. So now looking at that top left chart, you can see the ethane availability by basin. The dark blue areas is what's being recovered as of August. The light blue areas is what's being rejected. Now, you quickly notice that the biggest uh, pie there is for um, the South Central US, or PAD3. And we're recovering roughly 95% of all available ethane in PAD3. And as you move up to the Midcon, to the Rockies, the Bakken, and Appalachia, you can see that uh, we're recovering less um, and you can see the split between the recovery and the rejection. Now, the chart below shows pipeline tariffs. And I should have mentioned most of the demand for the market, that chemical demand for ethane, is in the US Gulf Coast. So you see the tariffs for moving ethane from the various regions down to the US Gulf Coast. And that's pertinent because as that PAD3 ethane demand uh, sucks up all the available ethane, we have to start moving further and further afield to recover the ethane. And for the gas producer, the decision that he's making is, do I want to leave the ethane in my local gas, or can I get a net back on that ethane that's higher than my net, net um, natural gas, and that incentivizes me to recover the ethane and send it down to the market? So he's going to look at the difference between the the gas price and the net back on ethane, which is gonna be the Mount Bellevue ethane price, less fractionation, which is the, the purification step to get the ethane separated from the other NGLs, and less that pipeline transportation. Now, if you look over to the text, Genscape was calling July ethane rejection uh, roughly 874,000 barrels per day um, for the entire US. I listed a bunch of projects that are gonna bring new ethane demand to the market over the next two and a half years. Those add up to just under half a million barrels. And those are all projects that have been sanctioned. So Genscape's seen that as well. And their forecast for January, 2023 rejection is, has dropped to 515,000 barrels. So you, you know, subtract the July uh, number from the January 23, and your recovery is increasing by roughly 41% or 359,000 barrels a day. So we're gonna be using everything in pad three, everything in pad two, we're gonna be pulling from pad four from the Bakken and Appalachia to satisfy that demand. And if you go to the next slide, I built up uh, just some cost curves based on Waha gas plus fractionation fee plus three and a half cents of transport uh, and that's the orange dotted line. The green dotted line is Midcon gas plus transport to Mount Bellevue plus a fractionation. The blue line is Rockies gas. And you can see the you know, left of the um, vertical dotted line is history. And the dark blue line is the ethane price. And you can see that the Waha price floor is held in pretty well. And in fact, this year, we've gotten over that Waha price floor. As we go forward in the forecast, because of that new demand that's coming on, the ethane price is actually, my forecast is the blue, the dark blue dotted line. 
and it's going to move up beyond the Waha floor to the Midcon floor next year. And then by 2023, it's going to hit that Rockies floor. So I think I listed the prices in the text down there. Um, as of, I think it was on the 12th, I was looking at the uh, strip. And at that point, the, the 2021 just Permian floor, which we're going to move beyond, had a 26 and a half cent price. And the Midcon floor uh, was getting you up uh, to, I can't see that in front of me here right now, but I think around 20, 28 cents or so. Um, or 34 cents, I should say. And then the uh, Rockies floor in 23 gets us up over 40 cents per gallon. So, you know, the, the, I guess the message here is prices are going up. They have to go up just to meet the demand that's coming online. One other quick point, if you look at that uh, solid dark blue line on the forecast, that's the forward strip as of uh, the 12th. And it's interesting that right now it's under the Waha floor. Um, so if you ask me, there's uh, probably some good money to be made on a trade there, buying the Ford ethane uh, strip and selling Waha gas. But that's a uh, that's just a personal view. Uh, so moving on to propane fundamentals. Next slide, please. Propane fundamentals um, are kind of like natural gas right now. Uh, we've got high stock levels, so it's it's a little bearish uh, by some uh, perspectives in the immediate term. And you can see that the middle chart on the right is a stocks chart. And, and you can see that uh, we've been at the high end of the five year range um, for the last several months, actually. But like I was saying on ethane, days of supply actually is more relevant because the, the, the export side in particular has been changing rapidly over the last several years. And we just need to hold higher stock levels to support loading vessels at the export docks. And if you look at days of supply, the picture actually is a lot more reasonable. Um, we're under the five-year average and we've been persistently under it for uh, most of this year. And for the most part, we've been tracking last year. The interesting story this year really is though, has been around supply, which is the top chart. And I apologize for not going in order on the charts here, but the top chart shows you propane supply from EIA weekly data. And you can see that red line where we started this year, over 2.4 million barrels per day was um, just you know, a, a big, big number relative to last year and relative to the five-year average. It started coming in though very quickly this year, pre-COVID, and it actually uh, bottomed out around mid-May. Um, we were down about 22%. We were down under last year's numbers and we we're approaching the five-year average. Now, during the third quarter, we had a big rebound and we kind of retraced about 50% of the reduction in supply. And that really was just a, a result of deferred wells coming online as well as shut-in production coming online. But uh, as we got to the late part of the third quarter and into September, we, saw, we started seeing things come on again. There was a bit of a blip there around the hurricanes, but overall the consensus view is that from here on out, um, supply is going to be coming down and it'll be decreasing at least through the first half of next year. In fact, in the last three weekly EIA stats, one of which we just got this morning, uh, we've had some decent stock draws on propane. Next slide, please. So this slide is um, just a, a basic domestic propane supply demand slide. Demand is the bars and supply is the blue line. And again, I wanna focus on supply. You can clearly see early in the last decade, we were growing very rapidly, 12% average growth per year through to 2015, which was just more than what the market and what its infrastructure could handle. So stocks went up, uh, logistical constraints started setting in and prices came down. And it wasn't just for propane, it was for natural gas and crude as well. So we had the first phase of what I would call an industry shakeout that started in 2000, late 2014, continued through 15 and uh, early 16. And that's what led to a rig count of roughly 79% from peak to bottom. It took a thirds for propane and for 16 and 17, we averaged roughly 4% per year. Now, unfortunately, money started flowing right back to the industry 
and people piled in in the Permian, rig counts came back up and so did supply growth. So from 17 to 19, we were back into double digit, low double digit, but we we're in double digit growth again. And again, we overwhelmed infrastructure and our ability to just manage that supply. So stocks got high, prices came down, and eventually um, rigs started coming off right after February of 2019. And they continued to come off uh, through this summer. And it's interesting that the drop in rig count is very similar to uh, that first phase of the shakeout. Um, rig count drop is about 77%. So the pre-COVID pre forecast as a result of all this uh, was for supply growth along that dotted line that you see there. And that was roughly 3% growth. Post-COVID um, forecast, and this is from Genscape in August, is calling for relatively flat propane supply growth. And you can see that the demand uh, all the way through is exceeding the supply. So we're gonna be drawing down, we're gonna have shortfalls every year, we're gonna be drawing down stocks. And as a result, there's gonna be pressure on prices to move up. Next slide, please. But we export more than 50% of the propane that's produced in the US. So as a result, we have to widen our perspective and look at the global markets. And this chart is similar to what Ben showed, and it's a handy way to, to kind of bring together supply and demand, what the effect is gonna be over the next four years. So at the end of 2019, you can see where demand was. It was around 10 million barrels per day globally for LPG. Now, 75% of that is propane, uh, but 10 million barrels per day. The ResCom piece, big internationally, big with developing nations like India, Southeast Asia, Central and South America. We had that growing uh, conservatively uh, in the low 2% range, about 2.3%. And then we have chemical demand. PDHs are on purpose propylene units. They use propane as a feedstock. These are projects in FID. Then you have ethylene demand that's coming up. These are projects also in FID, adding another 200,000 barrels per day of demand. So the, the total uptick over the next uh, four years would be about 1.2 million barrels per day. Now the EIA is forecasting non-US supply growth of 350,000 barrels per day. The U.S. over the last decade, or sorry, the world over the last decade has come to rely on U.S. growth to supply the rest. So the call on U.S. supply over the next four years is 821,000 barrels per day of LPG. Again, 75% of that roughly is propane, so call it just over 600,000 barrels per day of propane that the world needs to balance this new demand. Now remember on that previous chart, I was shown an August forecast of no supply growth for propane out of the US. So something's broken here. We're gonna have an issue. And that's gonna cause, and, and the market will fix itself and it's gonna fix itself through price. Price will cause some demand destruction, but price will also incentivize some growth in supply. Next slide, please. So remember I was talking about 1516 was that first phase of retrenchment that really happened as a result of high stocks, logistical uh, constraints, and low prices. And this chart shows seasonality uh, graph of propane relative to crude. You can see 1516 in the red. 19 and 20 are in the green, and they're kind of like what 1516 was. It was phase two of retrenchment. 1718, the blue lines, was the result of lower supply growth and the markets getting tighter. And during those years, the propane ratio to crude averaged 60%. We're looking at 21-22 to be similar to 1718. In fact, it's pretty conservative in my mind that it's going to look like that, but I think it's it's a good um, historical reference to use. And at Monday's strip, the 2020, 2021 through 22 crude was at $43. So if we take 60% of that, propane will be 61 cents per gallon on average through 21-22. Now the, uh, the propane forward curve that same day, which was on Monday, was just under 50 cents. So we're, we're predicting prices to be a good 
you know, 11, 12 cents higher than that. Now, the last slide I have on this, next slide, please. I just wanted to give a longer term perspective. If we focus in on the right hand side of the chart, that's really the last decade. And that was the period really where we had what I would call hyper growth and a couple periods of correction. Um, during that hyper growth period, propane relationship to crude, you can see really changed from where it was during the prior two decades. In fact, the correlation to crude in the prior two decades averaged 98%. And that ratio of propane to crude averaged 71%. When we started growing at double digits during the last decade, the correlation dropped to, uh, I think it was 85%. And the price relationship just kind of fell apart. It, it averaged roughly 47%. But it was interesting when growth corrected um, during 17 and 18, look at where that price ratio went. It went right back up into the 70s. And I kind of conservatively took an average of the two years where that ratio averaged about 60%. But what the point is of this chart is there, there's a good chance uh, that we're going to be going back to, uh, as Ben pointed out, Shell 3.0, much more conservative growth in a, a kind of reemergence of the balance that we saw in the past on that propane to crude relationship. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a good, point, good time to point out that range actually exports a larger portion of its LPG, its propane and butane, than any other producer. In fact, this past summer and fall, we're exporting 100% of our propane and butane. But we do retain the flexibility to move product domestically as sales and impacts change. And that's something that I'm looking at all the time. Regarding ethane, I believe we have the best and most diversified portfolio in the country. We ship ethane to Canada, Europe, and the U.S. Gulf Coast, as well as to local and basin customers. And we price it on a variety of different pricing metrics. So we use the Mount Bellevue Index for some of our pricing, uh, but we also use natural gas and we use crude. And we have some optionality within our contracts for that pricing. All this leads to strong NGL differentials for range relative to the Mount Bellevue index. And you can see that in the bottom left chart. Our differentials to that index uh, have been improving over time and we're getting a nice premium um, uh, as of late. So with that, um, I'll conclude by just uh, summarizing that, you know, NGLs are a meaningful part of the overall energy picture. To me, they're the most interesting part of the market because they, they touch all aspects of it, uh, but also they're a very meaningful component of Range's picture. And Range is really well situated uh, in terms of how we manage our NGLs. We see ethane fundamentals pointing to higher prices. We see propane prices um, strengthening versus crude. And uh, we see that the international markets are gonna continue to pull on US NGLs and our positioning uh, was gonna create premiums uh, for ranges prices. Uh, thank you. Hey guys, uh, this is Dan Steffens back on. Uh, Sabrina, is there any way you could give me control of the screen? Cause I've been typing out the questions rather than me read them. It might be easier if I put them on the screen and I can answer them with the actual questions. Still there? Uh, oh, well, maybe not. <laughs> okay. Um, let me just get to the questions. Uh, there, this is kind of a two-part question about LNG demand. It says, what is your view on LNG international gas demand growth in the long term? And uh, the second question is, if we, if we run short on gas in the U.S. for, uh, let's say, home heating or power generation, you know, considered critical to our economy, is there any way the U.S. can force a shutdown of LNG exports? Uh, okay, yeah, two very good uh, questions. Uh, let me start with the medium long-term gas outlook, and then I'll talk about the LNG shutoff scenarios for this uh, winter. Um, the outlook for global gas demand is, uh, in my view, uh, very bullish, driven predominantly by rising population and income growth in developing uh, economies, added to the fact that you have a number of key consumers like China and India 
implementing blue sky policies where they're literally choking on too much uh, coal coal fired generation so china right now um typically uh, residential homes are heated by domestic coal boilers there's a, there's a large program underway to replace all of the, that with city gas programs and you're only about uh, probably 50 percent of the way through that in in china uh, they're targeting uh, growth of natural gas in the primary energy mix of 15% from under 10% today, uh, reaching that 15% by 2030. That would still leave them well below the global average of 23%, uh, but it equates to over 30 BCF a day of demand growth just from China over the, uh, the next uh, 10 years. And this is in the context of a global gas market around 400 BCF a day. So significant growth to come from China. India is also starting to get more aggressive with the build out of their domestic pipeline uh, grid to uh, displace uh, some coal generation. Um, they're at roughly 6% primary uh, energy is, uh, is, is natural gas uh, today. So I think continued growth from gas uh, alongside renewables at the expense of coal is at least the trend for the next five to 10 years absent a major breakthrough in battery technology, which is not on the horizon right now. Um, the growing trend towards electrification of everything supports additional growth uh, in the power sector as well, which if it's gonna be uh, carbon neutral, can't be met by coal generation. And if it's gonna be met by baseload scalable uh, demand uh, supply, then uh, gas has to play a part of that. So mm -hmm. just look at, uh, take China as an example, every roughly hundred million uh, of EVs on the road versus traditional um, uh, uh, gasoline uh, cars would add an equivalent of eight BCF a day uh, of demand. And that's not factored into that kind of 15% of gas in the, uh, the energy mix. Mm -hmm. As to the question on uh, whether LNG can get shut off this winter, I mean, clearly in the summer, we saw that if prices dictate and the ARB closes, that LNG flows can be shut off. So we dropped as low as three BCF a day um, versus capacity of around 10 BCF a day. Uh, winter creates more complications, however, because a number of the off takers are utility customers who are going to be delivering to Asian and European utilities. So uh, if it was mild in Asia and Europe and it was cold in the US, then it would be much easier to, to shut, shut that off because there wouldn't be as much demand for that LNG internationally. However, if we see a um, uh, cold everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere this winter, then you, I think you see prices spike upwards. Uh, well, the, only way, the, the only way it really gets cut off is by price. I mean, there, there's nothing like the US government couldn't force it. Let's say we were running out, like our, our uh, gas and storage was getting dangerously low to meet our uh, heating demand. Uh, the, the government or something could not cut that off, could they? I'd be very surprised if I think there are other mechanisms or maybe on the industrial side, um, you'd see yeah, enough right, right. domestic coal generation as well. But I think your, your point is that um, I think the, it's underappreciated how potential price spikes this winter, if I talk about that work from home yeah, trend, right. may yeah. surprise. The other factor is that the market on the supply side is quite different versus five years ago because associated gas makes up a lot more of the supply mm -hmm. and depending where it's cold in the country you can have large freeze-offs because west Texas, they tend not to winterize their um, production so you can have if you had cold across the whole us you could have a lot lose a few bcf a day of gas uh, in the permian at the same time that you're uh, you're spiking demand everywhere so volatility is uh, certainly uh, likely to it to increase but uh, the shock absorbers to the upside can be energy shuttles if the price dictates yeah okay uh, a question that was typed into the chat board it says it seems like the majority of demand growth for natural gas comes from exports so how do you expect projects overseas such as in western australia uh, i guess increased uh, lng export capacity to impact the demand for us lng and then a follow-on question which i added was uh, what about exports to Mexico via pipeline? What's that future demand growth look like? Okay, I'll start with um, the LNG competitive supply outlook. It, it, it's clear that the, the competition for the next five years is going to be very, um, very strong. Um, 
saying that it's been strong for the last five years as well and the us has still managed to take 50 percent market share which is basically my assumption going forward uh, for the next five years as well and my demand forecast is for six percent um, annual lng demand growth which is what it's been for the last 15 years uh, the us sits towards the middle to so the low end of the lng supply cost curve um and at $3, gas can deliver into Asia with new build projects at around 7 to $7.50, uh, cheaper into Europe because uh, the shipping is obviously closer. The US does, however, have additional benefits. Um, the service uh, sector industry is very well established on, on the Gulf Coast, which limits uh, cost overruns. Uh, security of supply is obviously less of an issue compared with somewhere like uh, East Africa, where they're uh, facing Islamic militant issues for the, the Mozambique project uh, right now, which may lead to additional delays to that uh, to that project. And then terms of trade as well, any potential China trade deal with the US uh, energy and LNG can be a key component of that, which would enable the US to take uh, additional market share. In terms of the key comp competition, I, I don't see Australia as a main supply growth engine for the next five years as, as it has been for the last decade. Uh, the Western Australian projects uh, sit at the high end of the global cost curve. They've had massive cost overruns and delays and even now they're undergoing um, outage issues because of poor, potentially poor plant design at offshore and onshore facilities there. And on the east coast as well, they, uh, they, they're effectively exporting too much versus their domestic need and they're now having to consider importing gas for their domestic requirements, which is Never a good situation to be in. Uh, the key suppliers, I think, in competition with the US going forward will be Qatar, and they have announced um, a major project expansion over the next five to 10 years, and they are the low cost LNG producer. So expect that to go forward, uh, Russia as well. And then East, East Africa will be very competitive, but the security issues, I think, create quite a bit of delay and uncertainty in that regard. But as I said, with my demand growth uh, forecast and the projects that have already been sanctioned and factoring in additional Qatari expansions, it does support the two to three BCF a day of additional LNG exports that I have over and above what's been sanctioned out of the US uh, already. Um, internationally, you're seeing domestic pipeline declines of gas in places like Europe, as well as legacy LNG producers in Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, where projects that were launched 30 years ago are starting to run out of reserves and are going into decline as well. So uh, that supply can be displaced by uh, additional new projects going forward as well. On the Mexico question, um, I do think my Mexico outlook's pretty conservative. Um, uh, they've seen decent import growth from uh, the US uh, in the recent five year period. And it's worth remembering that 80% of domestic production in Mexico is associated gas from offshore fields predominantly. Uh, the longer we're below $55 uh, a barrel, the more declines you're likely to see from that perspective. And as of um, this year, uh, we're, we're pretty much completing the rollout of the domestic um, gas grid within, within Mexico. So that's enabling uh, exports to Mexico to reach new records currently. Um, and I think as we uh, as those projects get finalized this year, you'll displace um, about half a BCF a day of LNG imports that still remain in the country, uh, but potentially uh, low, the access to low cost US gas, I think can spur industrial demand in Mexico going forward, particularly as they have a large manufacturing base. So there's upside to industrial demand, I think, going forward in Mexico versus my forecast as well. Well, it's, it's definitely the clean hydrocarbon. I know that. Um, let me ask you this, on the NGL pricing, uh, where can we go or I can go to find like current prices on ethane and propane and stuff? Is there any way there's nothing like a, a NYMEX strip price for these you can go to? Actually, there is. Um, so the CME publishes okay. uh, a daily curve at the end of every day for each of the individual NGLs. Okay. So you, can, uh, you can definitely get it that way. You can probably just Google them as well, and you might find them in other Yeah, I've, I've tried Googling it, and, and I always go to, it's old data. Oh, is it? Maybe yeah. if, you can, if you can, and I have the CME group, maybe I just haven't looked hard enough on there. So anyway, yeah, if you, just, maybe if you email me a link or something about that, that would help. I can post in the chat. I've got propane up right now. <laughs> okay, okay. How, how um, so I, I see that like last year in the first quarter of 2019, 
uh, your NGLs sold for a combined price of $23 and change per barrel. Uh, and then they went down first quarter of this year to just below $16 a barrel and then dropped to $13.51 in the second quarter. Uh, what are they looking like for third and fourth quarter? If I, for, uh, for modeling purposes, what kind of NGL blended price would I use for range? And Dan, this is this is Lath. Obviously, we're going to be reporting earnings here in a okay. handful of days. And and the way that we've guided investors is to point them towards a differential to Bellevue. So to okay. your point, to the extent that you can pull up on the CME group, uh, what those prices are in our supplemental tables on our website, we provide you what the range barrel looks like. Mm -hmm. so you can volume weight it. Uh, but I, I guess I could I could provide this consensus for next year for the range barrel is somewhere in the $17 per barrel range. And that's based on strip pricing. Mm -hmm. And then I guess what I would, would point out is as Alan was, was mentioning in, in his commentary, if propane prices move to 60% of WTI, even at $43 per barrel uh, oil, yeah, yeah, you're, uh, you know, you're looking at a 20% improvement on propane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause I mean, I've been doing this for years and I, I tell you those prices flop all over the place and they're just kind of hard to, they don't move in lockstep with either one uh, oil or gas. That's the kind of the problem with forecast. That's right. uh, and the other thing, mo most people don't, they don't hedge a lot of their NGL. Now you guys probably do, but a lot of companies don't hedge any of them. Uh, yeah. There's no pun intended. There's a lack of liquidity in that market. Yeah, the right. out that you go. So our, our, our hedging, tends to be focused on the next three to six months out. Okay. Uh, here's one that just got uh, typed in. Uh, uh, what do you feel like is the impact of a Biden win on your forecast? I get this all the time. Uh, you know, I personally think the Democrats figured out that uh, if they ban fracking or something, it's going to be the end of their party because <laughs> it's going to double or triple uh, gasoline and home heating bills. So, but anyway, uh, how would you guys answer that? What do you think a, a Biden presidency does for your forecast? Ben, do you want to take that? Sure. I think it puts pressure on supply on the gas mm -hmm. side domestically. I think it's pretty clear that drilling on federal lands, which is around about 8% of supply domestically will be halted. Um, but those rigs can migrate uh, at least in the near term to other areas uh, as well. I think regulations on the coal side become even harsher. So that accelerates the closure of coal plants over the next five years, I would say. Um, you'll see more subsidies towards uh, renewables, but as I said, you need gas, as California has discovered, as, as backup uh, in those cases. Um, and I think building pipelines may become uh, more difficult uh, across the country as well, but that just increases the likelihood of pricing increases at the Gulf Coast, where most of the demand growth going forward is likely to be concentrated. And then just as a quick point of clarification, range has, has zero federal leases, so there'd be no impact there. And then obviously operating up in, in PA for the last 15 years, uh, I believe they have some of the most stringent standards uh, for the industry. So Mm -hmm. uh, we're well acquainted with operating within that type of framework. It's amazing how friendly states become when uh, you're jacking up their revenues. <laughs> anyway, uh, do you see any big surprises on uh, the international market that could uh, change the competition? I mean, is there any big thing coming online that's going to flood the market somehow? Um, in the near term, to my mind, the biggest risks would be obviously a mild winter globally. But right, on the right. supply side, it would probably be uh, Russian gas pipeline flows. Uh, Russian gas flows to Europe this year are down uh, probably around 3 BCF a day year over year. I'm expecting them to recover at least 2 BCF a day next year. Um, this is They could look to flow more to take market share, but uh, that's mainly dependent on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline being completed and with additional sanctions being placed on the project right now um, post the Navalny incident, um, I think there's a growing risk that, that that pipeline, which is a big pipeline, 5 BCF a day of capacity, gets delayed at least one to two years. Um, 
Now, bears might say that uh, Russia could decide to flow more through the Ukraine, which does potentially have another couple of BCF a day of capacity if they choose to, to follow that route. Um, but the, the, the counter argument is that they may not have invested enough in their legacy fields because the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is tied to a new area of supply. Um, so there are question marks about whether they could actually deliver that additional gas from their more mature areas through Ukraine if they decided politically that was the route they wanted to, to, to go down. Well, I guess the follow-up question to the Biden thing is that natural gas used, used to be known as the clean fuel, and it, I think it still is, but now environmentalists are uniformly hostile to any hydrocarbon fuels. Is there any chance of sanity returning? I'd say no, I'd say no to the sanity returning. <laughs> and I think I would point to, we, we actually went through some scenario analysis in our sustainability report. I think that's where I would point you to. And yeah. even under the most aggressive climate policy, you know, natural gas continues to play a really key role in meeting energy demands. Mm -hmm. So, and then even further to the extent that investors differentiate, you know, based on emissions, I believe Appalachian natural gas is really well positioned globally and then within that ranges at the absolute very low end in terms of emissions intensity so i i really think that natural gas is is set up well mm -hmm. uh and then within the natural gas space i think uh range is quite differentiated and we laid out a lot of that in the sustainability report that we put out this is i guess about a month and a half ago yeah you know when i go talk to uh, groups either school you know kids in our MBA program are just investors that aren't out of the industry. Uh, they hear this stuff about solar and wind uh, replacing hydrocarbons. And what they don't understand, solar and wind create electricity. They don't create transportation fuels or, you know, are the home heating uh, capacity that we get from natural gas. And uh, like you've said before, we need natural gas plants to back up the wind and solar plants uh, because they're not consistently uh, able to generate. So I actually think gas is a, on any kind of environmental situation, it's actually got a lot more upside than anything else. Would you agree? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a very good documentary that uh, Dr. Scott Tinker has put out recently, which covers the issue, particularly for uh, developing countries is not just the issue of, of emissions, but it's the issue of air quality, the issue of energy poverty, um, and, and in all cases, you're seeing a growing trend away from coal towards gas because of just the scalability of it and the mm -hmm. fact that you have high costs and intermittency issues around wind and solar. You need to keep uh, electricity prices low as well in those countries to uh, avoid them becoming uh, un unaffordable. So I'd, I'd highly recommend people watch uh, the Scott Tinker documentary. Yeah. I mean, natural gas just makes more sense than anything for power generation, if you ask me. Uh, a question here I, I saw today. Um, have you seen an update on the Cameron LNG uh, export facility? I know it was uh, taken down by one of the hurricanes. And, and is it back up online and what's going on down there? So uh, my understanding is that full electricity, uh, reliable electricity flow is back to the terminal. As of today, it's um, liquefying, taking about a BCF a day of feed gas capacity uh, with a, a tanker set to dock very shortly to um, offload uh, some of some of the gas their capacity is around two bcf a day so it's, yeah, not it's one of the large it's one of the larger export facilities we just added some expansions it total capacity is around two bcf a day the slight hiccup right now is that there's a sunken vessel in the calcasu pass mm -hmm. channel um, and it could take a couple of weeks to to dredge to get that out of the way. Uh, but in the meantime, they have managed to bring in a vessel with a 36 foot draft to at least partially load, if not fully load the vessel. So they, they're getting back. And I think as we get into November, uh, mm -hmm. these hurricane issues will be behind us and you'll see that big demand jump from the export side this winter, which will uh, just make the market tighter and tighter. Yeah, I just had uh, two more quick questions, and then um, you've got your contact information on here. I just urge everybody, if you have additional questions, things we haven't covered, uh, just go ahead and uh, email them to Lathe, and he'll pass them on to the proper party. Uh, the, uh, real quick, how many drilling rigs and completion crews 
are needed in the Marcellus Utica plays to keep that production flat? Are we, are we, do we have enough drilling rigs now or what's the situation? No, as I said, as I mentioned in my presentation, both the, both Appalachia and Haynesville are below sustaining levels mm -hmm. to keep production flat. Um, exit next year versus uh, current levels. Um, in Appalachia, the, the rig count, I mean, it's a moving target depending whether you're drilling dry or, or wet gas and what the shift is, but I'd say between 45 and 50 rigs in, in Appalachia um, and probably around 40 to 45 in the Haynesville as well. We're sitting at 34. Yeah, so we're way down. We're way down. Half of what we need, right? Yeah, but I'd expect to see rigs being added based on producer commentary yeah. of maintenance mode for, for next year. Yeah. Last question. Is range resources paying a dividend or do they intend to pay a dividend? Sure. So range, uh, range is not currently paying a dividend. Um, our, our focus primarily has been on, on reducing absolute debt mm -hmm. so where I laid out the case for 2021 with the significant free cash flow that we've got paired with the potential for additional asset sales. We can get ourselves much closer to our long-term, uh, balance sheet targets of we call it sub two times, well below two times levered. And as we get near those longer term balance sheet objectives, you know, then the conversation around what is the, the right return of capital to shareholders through dividends, share buybacks, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, then you, guys had, you guys had a share buyback going for a while, didn't you? And we still have one. Oh, okay. Okay. 30 million out of a, a hundred million. Okay. Well, that's it, guys. I think you did a great job. Uh, we ran over a little on time. Sorry about that, people. Uh, we have recorded this. We'll be sending out the recording tomorrow. Uh, so thanks a lot. And uh, we'll be talking to you guys. Very good. Thanks, Dan. I just say thanks to everybody for, for taking the time. It's, it's much appreciated. And feel free to reach out with any questions. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.